Let me put it this way. I, I like, I'd like to think that God is real. I don't believe in God because the idea that an omniscient, loving being would judge me who is mortal and ignorant based on a few years' experience, I find to be rather a cruel thought. All the power that God has, he, she, it has given to me. So we're definitely one. I hope, I hope there's, there's something else out there. It'd be, it'd be fun to experience either that or we're all just evolved apes. Um, I was raised atheist. I don't believe in a higher power, but I also don't claim to know everything about the world. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if there is one. I just pretend, I guess, and hope that there's something else out there. Well, if you're paying attention, you notice that that's actually the video from last week. <laughs> Today we're dealing with a different question. We are in the third week of our Explore God series, and we've been asking some difficult and important questions. Questions about life, faith, questions about God, questions we most of us ask or at least uh, wonder about, even if we think about them privately and don't say them out loud. And I'm reminded, I was reminded as I studied this week of a time... Uh, Years ago, when one of our boys, who was very young at the time, four or five years old, piped up at the dinner table and asked a surprising question. He said, could God eat the world in one bite? <laughs> Might have been the son that still likes to eat stuff in one bite. I don't remember. Uh, that's not a question we're dealing with in this series, but while I was trying to formulate you know, a theologically appropriate answer that he might understand at his age, uh, he answered his own question before I could say anything. He said, well, no, nah, he'd probably spit us back out, he said. And I was actually kind of proud of him because that's almost a direct quote from Revelations 3.16 that says, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Some time ago, I came across a small book entitled Children's Letters to God, in which children ask their own questions. You know, adults have their questions and children have their questions. Here are a few of the questions they ask. Dear God, did you mean for a giraffe to look like that or was it a mistake? You could probably ask that of a lot of animals, like the proboscis monkey. <laughs> Some of you are thinking about a relative right now, but <laughs> we won't talk about that. Or how about a blobfish? Did you know there was such a thing? Can you imagine a scientist sitting around trying to name this thing? I don't know. What are we going to call it? I don't know. How about blobfish? And I hope that does not make you think of a relative. Here's another question they ask. Dear God, is it true my father won't get into heaven if he uses his bowling words in the house? My mom says so. Dear God, in Sunday school, they told us uh, about what you do. Who does it when you're on vacation? Dear God, instead of letting people die and having to make new ones, why don't you just keep the ones you have now? You wonder about the child who wrote that one. Leads us to the question we want to talk about today. Why does God allow pain and suffering? Let's do just a little bit of review. We started a couple of weeks ago with the question, does life have a purpose? And we talked about how the prevailing view of our modern culture is that this life is all there is. The material world is all there is. And so there is no ultimate purpose of human life. The only purpose we, can, we have is the one we create for ourselves in these few years we're on the earth. The Christian worldview is a resounding, yes, life does have a purpose. And we find that purpose in our creator who created us to know and love him and to love each other. Then we, last week, asked the question, is there a God? The prevailing cultural view is that either no, there's not, this world, this material world is all there is, or we can't really know for sure, and eventually science will explain how everything got here, but the Christian worldview is a resounding yes, that God does exist, and we see evidence for his existence and for his nature in creation itself and in the deep sense of morality, justice, that every human being carries around within them. We talked about that last week. And today, we're asking the question, why does God allow pain and suffering? The question's a common one. For Christians, it's a common one for 
people who observe other great world religions, in fact, even for those who claim no religion at all. The question is common because we look around in the world and we look into our own experience and we see suffering. We see undeserved suffering. We see child sex trafficking and we're outraged. We know that things are not as they should be. And when we see suffering caused by disease or natural disaster, we want an answering for why these things exist in the world. In fact, as far back as 300 B.C., the question was formed by a Greek philosopher named Epicurus. He wrote, if God is all-powerful and all-loving, then why does he allow suffering? Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. If he is able but not willing, then he is malevolent. If he is both able and willing, then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing, then why call him God? And that question is still resounding in our culture today. But if we stop and think, and this series is causing us all to think a little bit more deeply than maybe we usually do. If we stop and think, the question itself is a problem. Because even to ask this question requires certain presuppositions and beliefs. First, we have to make an assumption about pain and suffering to ask the question. That pain and suffering are purely evil and nothing good could ever come of suffering. But we all know, just from our common experience, that there are times when pain does produce something good. Right? We know this. For example, going to the dentist. Not terribly comfortable, but good things come out because you get healthier and disease is prevented. Or, to take it much more serious level, enduring chemotherapy as treatment for cancer. Great suffering and great pain, yet all the while something good is happening, life is being preserved. So we can't make the assumption that pain and suffering never create something good. Second, we also have to make an assumption about God when we ask that question, because the question assumes a God who is equal or lesser in knowledge to the human being asking the question. Because to ask the question, we are assuming that, it's, that, that God could not possibly have a reason for pain and suffering that we could not understand. So the question's a problem. But the truth is, when someone asks this question, they are usually not asking for a philosophical or a theological treatise in response. Usually not. Usually we ask this question in a personal sense because something has happened. Something has happened to us or to someone we love that's created pain and suffering and thus the question. The question is addressed most powerfully and most personally in one of the oldest and most mysterious books of the Bible. Many of you are familiar with it. It's called the story of Job. Job is an ancient man. Here's a brief summary of how the story goes. In the very first chapter of the story, we learn that Job uh, was a, a great man, the greatest man in all the East. He was wealthy beyond measure. Uh, he had 10 children. He was a righteous man. And he worshipped God as his creator. And then we're told of a very strange conversation that happens between God and Satan, his great enemy, which we'll talk about in just a second. Satan essentially approaches God and accuses him of bribing Job to worship him. He says, you take away his wealth, you take away all that you've given him, and he will surely curse you to your face. So God says, okay, you can take away his stuff, but you can't touch the man himself. And the next, thing we know, the next thing we know in the story, marauding hordes of thieves come and steal all Job's wealth. Uh, we, we learn that fire falls from heaven, maybe lightning, burns up his barns and all his sheep. And we learn that a tornado, a great wind comes and knocks down his house, kills all ten of his children, all in one day. But Satan is wrong. Job doesn't curse God. He worships. So Satan tries again. He goes to God and says, touch the man, touch his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. God says, okay, you can touch the man, you just can't take his life. 
And then Job breaks out in painful sores all over his body. And he winds up sitting in a garbage dump, scraping his open sores with shards of broken pottery. He's so pitiful and in such great misery, his own wife says to him, why don't you just curse God and die? She could have used a little compassion training. But still, Job does not curse God. He continues to worship, but he does have questions. In Job chapter 10, we read this. I loathe my very life. Therefore, I will give free reign to my complaint and speak out in the bitterness of my soul. I say to God, do not declare me guilty, but tell me what charges you have against me. Does it please you to oppress me, to spurn the work of your hands while you smile on the plans of the wicked? Your hands shaped me and made me. Will you now turn and destroy me? Remember that you molded me like clay. Will you now turn me to dust again? Why then did you bring me out of the womb? I wish I had died before any eye saw me. In short, why? Why have you allowed all of this to happen to me? Now we're going to look at three things in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. First, the experience of suffering, and then the meaning of suffering, and then the redemption of suffering. First, the universal experience of suffering. That's point one. When I was about 12, my brother Joe about 10, like most boys, we were fascinated with Firecrackers. I think inside every man there's a little pyromaniac trying to get out. But we rarely had any firecrackers because we lived in New York State. You couldn't buy them in New York State. But one year we took a vacation, driving vacation, I think to Florida or somewhere. We went through South Carolina where, you know, there's a big fireworks stand like on every exit of the highway. You know, crazy cars, fireworks, three for one, all that sort of stuff. So somehow we managed to convince our father to pull off and buy us a few fireworks. You know, a few bottle rockets, maybe some Roman candles, sparklers, and a few hundred small firecrackers. And of course, we had to promise, uh, we had to promise, promise, promise never to play with them without his supervision. But eventually, once we got home, after a few weeks and stuff, the restrictions relaxed, and we were using them to blow up everything we could find. One day, when we'd run out of our toys to blow up, we were uh, out uh, a bit dis distant from our house, and we were lighting them by hand and throwing them as far as we could down this hill. It was great fun. Uh, but then uh, the thrill became to see how long we could hold on to them before launching them, because then they would blow up in the air, which was really cool. It was like playing chicken with fireworks. Again, not smart, but we were guys, right? Uh, so then we decided to try to light two fireworks from the same match and both throw them simultaneously. So I lit the match, held mine in there. He put his in, mine lit. He didn't think his lit. And I went to throw mine, and he went like this. This firework goes off in his fingers right behind his head. He, now, this is my little brother. He immediately turns to me and says, why did you throw it in my ear? I was like, well, I, mine was out there. You did that to yourself. It took me years to convince him that that was true. He was fine, just a little bit scared, but it took years to convince him that he did that to himself. Now, that story makes us smile a little bit. You know, boys will be boys. Here's another story. A couple of years ago, I was the on-call chaplain at Delnor. I got a call on a beautiful summer sun, uh, Saturday afternoon, about 4 p.m. Went to the emergency room, and there was a family there. Their little four-year-old son had drowned in a public swimming pool with people all around, lifeguards in their stands, and a mother sitting just yards away. When I got to the emergency room, the father was literally beating his fists against the wall until they were bloody. And he was screaming with a sound you don't want to hear. Why, why, why are you doing this to me? And that scene manifests itself thousands of times every day. Right here around our world and around the whole world. Traffic accidents, cancer, domestic violence, war, earthquake, on and on and on. Human life is tragic and always has been. And yet we are stunned and surprised when pain and suffering show up at our doorstep. The Christian worldview simply assumes the reality of human suffering. Jesus said in John 16, I have told you these things, so the enemy you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In 1 Peter, the Apostle Peter writes, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's come upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. There are basically three sources of pain and suffering in our experience. First, the pain we cause ourselves. My brother, Joe, the one with the firecracker, one, at one time when he was first learning to ride a bike, 
decided to see what would happen if he stuck his foot in the spokes while he was riding. He, he found out. Skidded the stop on his face, came back home all, all scraped up. I think we would agree that he sort of did that to himself. Or someone driving a car 60 miles an hour trying to send a text message while they're driving. If they get in an accident, we would say, well, you know, they kind of did that to themselves. The Bible describes this kind of pain as a result of foolishness or sin. Proverbs 19 says, when a man's foolishness brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. When a man's foolishness brings his way to ruin, he rages against the Lord. Most of us understand when we do something foolish or wrong, we kind of deserve the pain that comes our way. We'll talk more about that later. Secondly, there is the pain caused to us by others. The pain we experience because of the result of decisions someone else makes when they sin against us. When I was in about the first or second grade, I was walking home from school one day, minding my own business, when a big kid, like a fifth grader, I did not know, yelled at me from behind me. He said, hey kid, wait up. And I turned around and waited dutifully for this big kid to show up. When he got to me, he looked at me, and then for no reason at all, just slapped me right in the face. And then he said, what are you going to do about it? Just being a bully, right? Now, I would like to say, I looked back at him with squinty eyes. And I said, go ahead, make my day. (laughs) Put him in a headlock and taught him an eternal lesson, but I didn't. What I did was turn and cry and run all the way home, wondering what kind of world is this that we live in? And this is part of the ancient story of Job. Job did nothing wrong. He didn't make any foolish decisions, yet he suffered unspeakable pain because of evil he, that was completely outside his control. We see this kind of suffering every day as well. Thirdly, there's the pain that is both undeserved and random. Back in September, you'll remember there was an earthquake and a subsequent tsunami in a rigid region of Indonesia that killed nearly 3,000 people, left over 300,000 homeless. We see those stories every year. Nearly 16,000 children in the U.S. are diagnosed with cancer every single year. The Bible not only assumes pain and suffering to be universal, but it also points to the origin of pain and suffering. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I'll come back to that later. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Four times, Paul refers to the brokenness of creation itself. The Christian worldview is that when sin entered the world, way back in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, all of creation was subjected to the curse of sin. And the whole world was no longer as God created it originally, but it was broken. Therefore, pain and suffering and death are all inevitable and universal in human experience. And that leads us, secondly, to the meaning of suffering. When my brother cried out, why did you throw your firecracker in my ear? He was looking for meaning. When that father who lost his little boy cried out, why? He was looking for meaning. He wanted to understand the reason for his pain. And throughout human history, every culture and every religion has tried to make sense of suffering. There are several choices, and I'll only cover a few of them this morning. There is moralism, and that is that life is fair. The universe is fair. Therefore, everyone gets what they deserve. Good people get good things. Bad people get bad things. It's the doctrine of karma. The Bible does not teach that the universe is fair. It does not teach the doctrine of karma. We'll come back to that later. Or there is denial. Buddhism is one of the great world religions. It teaches basically denial, that suffering is the result of our desires. If we can just eliminate our desires, suffering will go away. That's not what Christianity teaches. Suffering is real. can't be denied. Then you have cynicism. That's the material universe is all there is. Therefore, suffering and pain are ultimately meaningless and random. Christianity does not teach that pain is meaningless. 
And then we have our modern North American culture in which we seek to eliminate the causes of all pain and suffering through economics, education, science, political action, medicine. We try to eliminate it. But alas, we are discovering that's impossible for us to do, so we often just seek to avoid it at all costs. The Christian worldview is unique in that it teaches that life is not fair, suffering is often random and undeserved, and yet suffering is not meaningless. Christian understanding is based on, first, that human beings were created in love and for love. That is, a transcendent and personal God created human beings for relationship with himself and with each other. And all genuine relationships require love. And love requires freedom. And freedom means that the created has the opportunity or freedom to reject the creator if the creation so desires. For example, back in the book of Genesis, God created Adam and Eve for relationship with himself and each other. Then he gave them everything in the garden, except he made one limit. You cannot eat from that tree. And then he gave them the choice to choose to obey his limit or to disregard his limit, and they chose to disregard. Let me give you an example as a parent. I love my children, and I don't want bad things to happen to them, and I don't want them to do bad things, right? So I could choose to chain them in their rooms, lock the door, and nothing bad would ever happen to them, and they would not do anything bad, but that would not be love, would it? be something far different. So God, in his love, created us with freedom, and that explains the pain we bring upon ourselves by our choice, and it explains the pain we receive when others choose to do things that hurt us. But secondly, the Christian worldview also teaches that creation itself is broken, as we said moments ago. The Christian view is that God created the whole universe as good, created human beings in his own image to enjoy love and and freedom and peace and joy. But in their freedom, human beings chose to reject the relationship with their creator, which led to the curse of sin and infected the entire universe. So that not only are human beings broken, creation itself is broken, and sin, evil, suffering, and death have been unleashed in the universe. And we see this manifested a thousand times every day. Now, the story of Job is very instructive at this point because it gives us a glimpse behind the curtain into a great unseen spiritual battle. That is, it is not God who inflicts Job with pain and suffering. It is Satan who attacks Job, trying to destroy his faith in a good God. The Bible teaches that Satan is the great enemy of the Creator God, that Satan seeks to destroy all God made as good. So Satan is the source of all evil and death in the world. The Christian view is that there is a cosmic spiritual battle going on even now for every square inch of the universe. And God has chosen to allow his enemy limited authority for a limited time to wreak havoc on the earth. But one day, the day that is still coming, he will make all things right again, judge all evil, and ultimately destroy his enemy and destroy the final enemy that the Bible calls death. And we'll get there in just a moment. So we ask, why has God allowed his enemy to wreak havoc on the earth? And that leads us to the third thing, part of the Christian faith, and that is that suffering has a meaning that we cannot see. Suffering sometimes has a meaning that we cannot see. The very question, why does God allow pain and suffering, assumes that to say God is loving and pain exists is contradictory, that those two can't be true at the same time. The Christian view is just the opposite, that we can believe that God is all-powerful and all-loving and yet acknowledge that pain and suffering are not contradictory to his existence. If God is good and God is God and we are not, is it not possible that he could have a purpose and meaning for pain that we cannot see clearly from our perspective? For example, think of a 16-year-old boy who violates curfew and is grounded by his parents. To the 16-year-old, this is intolerable suffering that makes no sense in his worldview. But to the parent who sees things from a much different perspective, it's actually for his good. Or think of a mosaic. 
A mosaic is basically just made of crushed stone and glass. Little useless pieces of things good for nothing but the garbage bin. But in the hands of the artist, becomes a masterful piece of art. This is actually a detail from a, piece of, from a mosaic called Christo uh, Pancrat, Pan, I knew I was going to struggle saying this, Pancrator, that's in the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, regarded as one of the most beautiful uh, mosaics in the history of the world. And finally, Christians believe that pain and suffering actually serve to point us to God. Because when we rage against suffering and evil, we are actually agreeing with the God of the Bible that things are not as they should be. Something is broken in our experience and in our world. How will things get better? When will they get better? Who will make them better? And that leads us to the third part today, that is the redemption of suffering. You'll remember that in October of 2006, a gunman went into an Amish schoolhouse in a place called Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania. Took a whole bunch of little kids hostage in a classroom. Eventually, he shot and killed seven little girls, excuse me, five little girls between the ages of seven and 13, and then killed himself. Unspeakable tragedy. But then within hours of the shooting, the Amish community came around both the parents and the wife of the shooter and promised to stay with them through the whole painful process. And when the shooter's funeral took place, more than half of the audience were made up of Amish people who were related to those that the shooter had killed. And the Amish spokesman said that the families that had lost children had already forgiven the shooter. How? How could they forgive such evil? Because their faith had shaped their understanding. The world is broken by sin and death. God is good and sovereign. Life is not fair. Suffering is undeserved. But suffering is not meaningless because death is not the end in the Christian worldview. God has given us a great hope. In 1 Peter we read, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are being shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. The uniqueness of the Christian faith is that it allows for both the depth of human suffering and provides hope that extends beyond the grave. That's the uniqueness of the Christian faith. And God gives hope because he's given us his son. In Hebrews chapter 2 we read, But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. So that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. The claim that God, who created all things, has entered into the suffering and pain of human existence through Christ is absolutely unique of all the religions of the world. It's unique to the Christian faith. And through his son, God gives his promise. Again, the Apostle Paul, words we read earlier this morning, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not of its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. See, the Christian view is that all suffering will be redeemed, purchased, bought back because the power of sin and death has been broken by the death and resurrection of Christ. The resurrection promises the restoration not only of our lives, but of all of the created order. The resurrection promises that all suffering will be redeemed and has already been redeemed. 
over 20 years ago. Now, uh, Lorene and I took our boys. At that time, we had just three. Fourth one hadn't been born yet. To Malaysia to visit her relatives, where she spent many of her growing up years. Um, and when we got back home, it was a great trip. When we got back home, one of our boys, who was about four at the time, uh, developed a, a, a fever and a weird rash on the palms of his hands and the bottoms of his feet. Just, it was weird. So we took him to our doctor. He suggested maybe you need to get that checked out because you were just out of the country. So we had to take him to a big hospital in Chicago and see a, a specialist in infectious diseases. And he told us that it was possible that those symptoms were of something called Kawasaki's disease, which in young children sometimes produces damage to the heart. So, and it could be very dangerous. So now we're frightened, and so they had to do a blood test to make sure. And so we went into this little waiting room, and I'm holding this, 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 my son on my, on my lap, and he could tell something was up and not good, so he was hanging on to me pretty tight. And then this nurse came into the room, a kind lady, but she was a nurse, and she was carrying this syringe, giant, about that, it was a giant needle with a big reservoir on it, and he was just a little tiny guy. And she said to me, sir, do you want to hold him or do you want me to restrain him? I said, no, no, I'll hold him. And as she got closer, he was clinging on. I whispered to him, I whispered to him, this, this nice nurse lady is going to poke your arm. And it's going to hurt, but it's only going to hurt for a little bit and then it'll be okay. And then he looked back at me. If you're a parent, you'll understand this. And eyes welling with tears. And he said, daddy, why are you letting her do this to me? he could have just seen into my heart. I would have allowed her to stick me a hundred times over, and I hate being stuck. A hundred times over to spare him. I would have gladly shared my own blood with her. Why? Because he's my son. But my love required that I allow his pain. So when we ask, why? Why? The Christian answer is that the world is broken. All of creation is broken and groans. Suffering is in the world because sin is in the world. And we don't always understand why. We can't always see the reasons. But that's not the way it was meant to be. That's not the way it will always be because God promises to redeem all suffering. And he has done so through his suffering. Pastor Tim Keller has this beautiful line in one of his books. He says, Christianity empowers its people to sit in the midst of this world's sorrows while tasting the coming joy. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, it's true that we all have questions. It's also true that we all experience pain and suffering sooner or later, some even now, and we don't understand. We can't see with your perspective but you have not left us alone. You entered our world. You have borne our sorrows and our sufferings. And you've promised to redeem and restore all things. I ask that even as we ask, why? You would hold us fast and infuse all our questions and all our pain with hope. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.